Welcome everybody to the International Observe the Moon Night 2018 webinar with Andrea Jones from NASA Goddard. Every month when we do a webinar featuring the science of NASA, we also highlight an outreach activity related to the topic. So this month we're looking at the moon and we have an activity to engage your audience in lunar observations and also in some of the history of the moon. So this one is called Toad in Moon, and Dave Prosper is gonna um, show where to find all these in the chat. You can find all of these resources on bit.ly slash NSN Moon Night. So that's for Night Sky Network, Moon Night. But all of the resources that we're presenting tonight can be found there. So Toad in the Moon is from Family Astro, an Astronomical Society of the Pacific program. This focuses on the legends and stories surrounding the moon, and it takes between five and 10 minutes to do. It's nice to do before you get started observing so that people can have a minute to look at the moon. It's good for all different ages, but kids love it especially. So this talks about many of the different stories, the fox that can be seen um, in the moon from people in Peru. We've got the rabbit in the moon from the Aztecs of Mexico and beyond. Uh, and the toad in the moon from China. That's where we get the name for this program. So each of those tells a little story about what they see in the moon. And then there's a worksheet where kids or families can draw what they see in the moon. Sometimes it's their, someone in their family. Sometimes it's a story that they really like. Um, and then they can write what character they see and tell a little story about it. So it's a nice way for them to start observing those features of the moon and a nice way to observe uh, International Observe the Moon Night. So now for our fe featured program, I want to introduce the fabulous Andrea Jones. She is an education and communication specialist at the NASA, Go NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in the Planetary Science Division. What that means is that she works with missions and research teams learning about all of the cool stuff that they're doing, and then she gets to share it with us. One of her many hats that she wears is as the director of the International Observe the Moon Night, which is why she's here tonight. She is the one in the know. So please welcome Andrea Jones. Well, thank you very much, Vivian. Um, and thank you all so much for being here tonight. I am very honored to be a part of your program. I am a huge fan of um, the Night Sky Network and we have been working with Vivian um, and ASP and Night Sky Network for many, many years. And it's just wonderful to be a part of this. And so um, I want to start off by figuring out how to share, here we go. Um, I think I'm going to share my desktop, so sorry about this. Um, oh no. This was all, of course, working so well just a moment ago. And can you hear me? It's working? Yes, we can, can hear you. Okay, great. My there computer is telling me that my audio great. isn't working. <laughs> so I'm glad that's not true. Excellent. So that's what happened to me earlier. That's why I had to ask. <laughs> ah, okay. But you're well, sounding I great. <laughs> Excellent. That's great. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's the, the popular joke how we can get to the moon, but we can't, you know, connect, you know, in a, in a room or here in this case, a virtual room. Um, but it's been such fun to see all of the people uh, joining in. It's so fun to see where everybody is. Uh, right now, I'm talking to you from New Jersey, uh, not where I'm uh, from, but this is where my parents live. And I'm going to help with uh, an event at the Sea Air and Space, Intrepid Sea Air and Space Museum tomorrow. So it's fun to be catching up with some of you in campgrounds and in um, time zones across the US and beyond. So this is, this is great. Um, I imagine that most of you are familiar with International Observing Moon Night and hence you're here, but if you're not, um, I'll give you a little bit of a background of what's going on um, and uh, sort of show you the new and the, the great uh, for this year and encourage you to be thinking about what you might wanna do with this as well. So for those of you, um, who are not familiar or who are just getting uh, involved. Let's see, oh, that might skip twice now. Let's see. Um, International Observing Moon Night um, is basically just a celebration. It's a celebration of lunar science, of planetary science, of the moon. Um, and we try to get 
everybody on earth outside looking at the moon and learning about the moon and talking about the moon with one another um, and, and maybe you know finding out something new maybe sharing uh, some lunar enthusiasm with neighbors or friends who may not know a whole lot about that neighbor of ours out so close to us in space um, so the lunar reconnaissance orbiter has led this effort for a long time uh, my uh, one of my roles is as the public engagement lead for NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, but we also really, really like having the moon be the gateway to the solar system and beyond. So we love featuring all kinds of space science um, and earth science um, at these types of events and, and really enjoy having libraries get involved with their books and, and artists getting involved and all that. So it's just an opportunity to come together and talk about it. And so um, for those of you who may be new to this also, uh, we actually started out as a national Observe the Moon Night, um, or even before then, it was a celebration of when the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and our sister mission, LCROSS, um, the Lunar Crater Observing and Sensing Satellite, I think, um, went to the moon in 2009, and we just wanted to have a big party to say, yay, we made it, we're in orbit around the moon. Um, and then from there, there was so much excitement about that that it's kept going since then. Um, so 2009 was our start, um, and we're, we're still, actually 2010, I guess, was our start, but we're, we're still going. Um, so through International Observer Moon Night, hopefully uh, many of you are familiar with this, uh, but in case you're not, it's a chance to bring people like you who are experts in, in space science and observing out into communities to share that experience with other people. So some of my favorite events are, you know, outside of ice cream parlors where it's you go for, you know, an ice cream treat, but you get two because there's a telescope outside. Or there was one wedding where people had all of their guests go out and look at the moon. And I feel that's a level of dedication that's very honorable. So if that was you or if you know that person, Good for you, that's great. We don't require that kind of commitment, but um, we do love the diversity of, of events that are out there. Um, there was another one that I really liked was a whole biker gang, uh, a motorcycle gang, stopped by at this big telescope, uh, field of telescopes and looked at the moon. So all kinds of different ways. So it's everyone, everywhere, all the time. Um, and it's a chance, again, to learn about lunar science, which there's always so much lunar science to learn about. And anything else related to the moon, use it as your launching pad to talk about whatever space science topic you think is most interesting. Are there other moons in the solar system that you like to feature? Are there other moons that you're hoping to discover around exoplanets? Or, or wherever it is that you like to look, we, we want to help you get there as well. Um, and just tying back to that nearest neighbor um, in space. And, and we find that you know through events like this, um, with our extensive evaluation, people are actually learning about the moon and they're excited to learn more. And that is in great um, part because of what you do to share the moon with your community. Uh, because I know so many people from the Night Sky Network are involved in this program. And so I really, really thank you um, for getting involved or wanting to get involved. We love new folks too. So last year, um, we had a little over 600 events um, that were registered. We know that there are more events in places like Africa. We work with Astronomers Without Borders. Um, we're actually rekindling that relationship uh, to make it more robust right now. Um, but there are a lot of people in places that don't have internet, and so they can't register, uh, but they're still involved. Um, and we're, of course, always hoping to grow and build and diversify. Um, we did have three states last year, or four states last year, that did not participate, so we're very disappointed. So if you're out there from around the country, make sure your state is involved. We want to get all 50 again this year. Um, but I know that we're, we're working towards that already. Um, and lots and lots of people, of course, since 2010. And it's not, I mean, it's always fun to have the numbers. Um, that's not really why we do it, because every single person that's involved um, is someone that we're excited to have looking at the moon and learning about the moon. Um, but it is kind of a fun thing to know that if you are one of those uh, dots on the map, that you are part of a global celebration the world comes together one day each year to do something really awesome and really exciting. And you're connecting to you know, people in every country and we're gonna try to make the most of that this year with a few new initiatives um, and really build on those international connections. Um, but 
yeah, it, it does, our funding primarily comes from NASA, so we do, of course, uh, want to serve the U.S. audience as much as possible, but I think it's really fun to, to be with people all over the world looking up at the moon. All right, so as I mentioned, um, our uh, everyone, everywhere, every year, that's our, our new uh, tagline as of a poster I'm helping um, Tyler Norgren, in case any of you know him, he's working on a poster for us for International Observe the Moon Night, and I thought, hey, that sounds like a good line to put on there. So that's the new line, Vivian, surprise, this is what we're gonna talk about. <laughs> Hope that's okay with you. Um, but again, the diversity is just really wonderful and the people are what make it great. So um, for those of you who have events, I would love to hear what you do and how you bring International Observe the Moon Night to your community. Um, because what's special about this event is essentially it's an idea. We want to get people outside looking at the moon, learning about the moon, celebrating the moon and all the connections. And we want you to do that in whatever ways interest you and serve the interests and needs of your audience and also that make use of the resources that you have available. So, you know, people, I, I have friends who go out on their porch and, you know, have a lunar treat and look at the moon and actually they print off the moon map that I'll show you and just look up and, and talk about the moon and, and see it from their backyard and that's great. Or you might have a huge event with thousands of people and have lots of subject matter experts there from NASA or a local university or wherever, and that's great too. Or it could be somewhere in between. It could be anywhere in between. So um, we definitely encourage you to partner with someone. Um, for those of you um, who have institutions available to your um, astronomy club, excellent. Use that and, and run with it. But if you do not necessarily have that, you might want to partner with a library or a school or a university or a planetarium or a park or anybody um, who is interested in working with you. It's really wonderful to bring you know, both the science expertise and the equipment like telescopes or binoculars um, along with folks who have bathrooms and lighting and parking and all those kinds of things. Um, but we also really like that you don't need a telescope and you don't need a beautiful dark sky. Even though those are great, it's not required. Um, so please go out and, and do it however you like. Um, just as an example from Goddard, uh, we have you know, our scientists talking about the moon with actually lunar samples and you're able to borrow lunar samples from NASA as well um, if you're associated with an institution. Um, we have telescopes, of course, um, and then we also, I don't know if you can see in the top right, um, we like to print off galleries of lunar images. So um, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera um, has a gallery that we made in collaboration with the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, and now it's all available online, and you can print out images from that collection and, you know, basically just wallpaper your house is what I would encourage you to do with them or, you know, bring them to an event and share them um, with people. And we just print them on fabric and then, you know, take them around wherever we happen to be going. Or you can print them on paper or whatever it is that you have available. Um, we will be sending you some items as um, Vivian mentioned and uh, Dave mentioned. So that's going to be coming to you, but feel free to use whatever it is that you have available. All right. But now for some things that we are able to provide you um, and everyone in the world as well as you. So new website, this is fresh off the press. I think it was today or maybe yesterday, but right now this moment, um, moon.nasa.gov slash observe is our new virtual home. This is very exciting. We are working with JPL um, and they have amazing tech people. Um, we had a really nice home at the Lunar and Planetary Institute for a long time and we very much appreciated all of uh, the work that they did to, to bring our content out to the world. But it's really exciting to be at the site that people go to learn about the moon from NASA and right on that same page we have our flagship event. This is one of the biggest events that NASA does anywhere and it's really wonderful to now be at the place where people are going for content. Um, so uh, I see that someone is asking, and again, it's moon.nasa.gov slash observe. So this is a brand new site. Um, and we're, if you still have the old website, it'll redirect here. So don't worry on our 
advertising materials we're just switching over but on this new website we have so many things um, some of them are you know we have information we have um, about the moon generally and all kinds of things but we do also have some specific event materials um, including the poster on the left that if you're in the night sky network uh, you will be getting in the mail so look for that um, and then we also have on the right a fillable flyer so if you go to our website you can fill out hey i'm from massachusetts and i am going to be having you know an event in this park at this time um, and also both here and on the website now when you are registering you don't have to have an event on October 20th. October 20th is the day um, for 2018 because we wanna pick a day that as many people as possible can be united in looking up at our neighbor in space. But we recognize that this is not a convenient date for everybody. And so we think you should go out and look at the moon and learn about the moon every day. Um, but if you can't have an official event, um, on October 20th this year, then pick a different day that's somewhere nearby. Um, try to get, you know, as close to the 20th as possible. Um, but having fillable flyers and having um, on our event map on our website, it'll say the date of the event so people don't go at the wrong day. Um, so that is up to you and we want to make this um, as, as accessible to everybody as possible and as, you can tailor it the way that you want to. But these are some example um, event materials. We also have press release um, templates and, and many, many other things to help you prepare for your event. Tips about things you might want to consider, ways to find partners, things like that are also on there to get ready. Um, in addition to having physical presences and um, resources, we are very excited to unite lunar enthusiasts worldwide um, through social media. So we are on a whole bunch of platforms. We're on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Tumblr and Snapchat and wherever people are talking, we are there talking about the moon. Um, and we used to have an Observe the Moon Night um, specific account. And actually there is a Facebook page um, that somebody out in the world decided should exist. And people have taken it and run with it. And it's just a host run page, which we think is fabulous. And we contribute sometimes, but that's actually not ours. Somebody came up with that and we are very excited about that. Um, we do post content, specifically my colleague Molly Wasser, um, who sits with me at Goddard in my office. She's amazing. And she is the voice of NASA Moon. Um, so hopefully, all of you out there, if you are on um, Twitter, you are following NASA Moon because she provides such fabulous content. Um, my favorite, uh, actually, my two favorite things about Molly with NASA Moon are that she changed how NASA capitalizes Moon uh, because of her announcement of this Twitter account and people were very upset that it was a lowercase m following style guide and she got enough people upset about it that totally unintentionally that now we are capitalizing Moon at NASA which I'm very excited when we're talking about Earth's Moon. Um, and also, she's the tweet that broke the internet last summer uh, for the eclipse where she blocked NASA Sun, and that was really fun. And hopefully many of you saw that. Otherwise, you should go look it up if you're on, on, on the Facebook and the Twitter and all of those places. Um, that was pretty fun. So we like uh, getting involved in those conversations because people get hooked and then stay with us all year. And we would love to feature you and your content um, on social media. And we're going to have featured hosts next year on moon.nasa.gov slash observe. We're going to be sharing with um, everybody examples of some of the amazing um, lunar connections that people make around the world. And if you are interested, send us some pictures, send us some stories, send us some, some quotes um, from participants and we'll get you up on our page and show the world um, what amazing things happen uh, when people are excited about the moon. So um, let's see. Those are just some examples. Observe the Moon is our hashtag on all platforms, so you can find us there, and we'll be ramping up even more coming up. Um, then some examples of products. There are so many things. I don't want to tell you about everything. I want you to go check things down yourself um, to see what else there is. It's a treasure hunt. Um, but I do want to highlight our 2018 moon map. So we make a map of the moon 
every year and it highlights some objects that are near the terminator of the, of the moon, which is my favorite uh, celestial term because I love that terminator is the line between day and night. And when I learned that, I just wanted to tell everyone. So I know many of you are familiar with this, but if not, join me in, in sharing that with the world. Um, so we want to highlight those features because that's right on the dawn dusk line. And that's where the most beautiful uh, viewing is, at least in my opinion, and I'm sure many of you share that. Um, and so that's where the shadows are great. And you can really see um, topography pop along those, those day night lines. So I also wanted to show you both of our moon maps uh, because of course in the Southern hemisphere, the moon looks upside down if you're a Northerner. Um, and this is also great for telescopic viewing. Um, if you're looking at uh, the moon through a telescope and your telescope flips the moon, well, look at that. You can use the other hemisphere's map um, as well if you'd like. So this is the front of our 2018 map, um, or of our two different maps. And then on the back, each of those um, featured uh, places has a closer view um, and then a description. So people um, either just in their backyards can, can learn about that, or you can choose to highlight those um, at your event as well. So I really enjoy that product. Uh, Brian Day from NASA Ames and from the Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute survey uh, makes those for us every year. And Jen Baer is our graphic designer for all of our amazing art. So some really, really talented people on our team. Um, and then I also like to give a plug out for observing the moon all the time. And what better way to do that than to um, start a moon observation journal at your international Observe the Moon Night event. Um, so this is, you know, we have this and we have on the other side some questions that you can ask people or they can fill out after they fill out their journal. So I encourage you to, to promote uh, long-term lunar observing at your events. Um, we just launched this website Today, yesterday, um, we have 105 people already telling us that they're gonna look at the moon, um, many of them in the US, but also internationally, so that's very exciting. For you fine folks in the Night Sky Network, you don't actually have to register on our map. Um, you can register through the Night Sky Network and we will import your data onto this map. So you don't have to do it two times, um, but we do want you to come and see what else we can offer you um, on the website, but you don't actually have to do that. So for this year, also special, um, we're highlighting, of course, um, the Apollo 50th anniversary. So last year, you may have heard of it, there was a big eclipse um, in the US. Some people uh, might have heard a little bit of something. Um, and we want to build on that. We've had so many more people excited in the US, especially about um, eclipses and about the moon and about space uh, because of the eclipse. And we know other places in the world have that same sort of um, boost in, in space science um, interest after eclipses. So we want to build on that. We want to feed that. We want to keep those people excited about space science engaged. Um, and this International Observer of the Moon Night is one opportunity to do that. Um, and the Apollo anniversary, of course, is a great time to celebrate a human triumph. Um, and so we are going to try to help you do that if you'd like to feature it at your event. So we're going to have some resources featuring the Apollo 50th, um, some slide presentations that have some information um, about past, present, and future exploration, uh, because the Apollo anniversaries are not just about looking back about how great that was, it's about how the Apollo program built um, up our understanding of essentially, you know, the solar system and beyond in terms of at least um, physical geology of all of these objects and you know helping us figure out the age of the solar system and the earth and all all those things um, inspired earth day you know going to the moon let us look back at the earth and, and our tiny little amazing spot in the vastness of space so this is something to to celebrate um, and international observe the moon is certainly one way to do that um, so there are gazillions of resources out there for um, the Apollo anniversary. We will highlight some of them on our website. Um, and one of them, I, I wish I could see all of you. I'm sorry, I can't. I would ask for a show of hands. But if you have not seen the Earthrise video, um, Ernie Wright in our scientific visualization studio at NASA 
recreated the moment where the Earth Rise photo was captured um, in such amazing detail. It's truly remarkable. On this spacecraft here, this is a clip from his um, video, every sticker on the spacecraft actually has the correct text if you zoom in he checked and made sure all of the text was accurate he took the the original audio files from the mission um, and remastered them and actually solved a mystery um, of who took the earthrise photo it was a debate among the astronauts on apollo 8 uh, two people claimed credit for this photo, and so Ernie invited them and their spouses to Goddard to watch this video together, um, and the wife of the astronaut who didn't take it said, honey, you didn't do it afterwards, which I think is very funny. Um, but Bill Anders is um, the, the real uh, photographer of Earthrise, um, and now Ernie has in his office a signed image of Earthrise, signed by Bill Anders saying, uh, your Earthrise is better than mine. So there's my plug. Go watch this video. It's amazing. Um, and that's something that you can share with your communities as well, or your family, or just for fun on the couch. It's great. Um, so for current exploration, I mean, there's so much to be said here. I just thought I'd mention again that LRO is taking amazing data um, and, and capturing so many things that you can then um, discuss as well if you'd like to. And many of you may be familiar with this mission. I really hope you are. And if you're not, um, get involved. It's so great. There's so many different uh, ways that we're learning about our, our nearest neighbor in space. And a few of them um, I'll highlight here. So one of them is just our cameras. Our cameras can take pictures of you. If you went to the moon and lay down on the moon and made a moon angel, we could see you. Um, and we are recapturing um, the moon over and over and over. And that's actually really important because the longer we're there, the more we can actually see the surface changing today, which is remarkable. So we have these great images near and far side. We're making improvements to impact crater science. So this um, right in the middle is Tycho Crater. Of course, you can see that you know, with your eyes just looking out at the moon without any assistance. But if you have assistance, like a camera on a spacecraft orbiting the moon, you can take images like this. Um, so this is our out of the airplane window kind of view when we rolled our spacecraft over to capture that. And in case you're not familiar um, with this mystery as well, another one of my favorites, that little you know, pebble at the top there, I would ask you if I were had you, the opportunity, um, but this is the size of a baseball stadium. It's a baseball stadium-sized rock on top of a mountain inside of a giant impact crater. And according to the impact crater modeling um, material that we had at the time this image was taken, it's not allowed. Like you cannot have a baseball stadium sized rock on top of a mountain in the middle of an impact crater that is sloshed with impact melt. And yet there it is. So it can happen. So we're having to rethink our, our understanding of one of the most fundamental geologic processes in the universe. Um, and we're doing that with spectacular Ansel Adams style photographs. So I think that's great. Um, just because the cameras are so amazing, I'm gonna zoom in again. So in this image, um, the, the crater in the middle is Dionysus, and this is zooming in on that crater, and I just, oh, I couldn't help myself. Just some eye candy, everybody. It's amazing. I feel like it's waterfalls on the moon, and each one of those lines that you can see in the dark patch, those are individual lava flows that helped build up over a huge amount of time, slowly, slowly, um, the mare that we can see. And then this is dust um, flows cascading down. Um, this is just, this is captured, snapped in time. Um, so it's, it's static right now, or at least for the most part, I mean, it's still slope failures going on, but I think it's just remarkable. Um, and that's not from ice melt. That's all dry granular flow. Um, but it is, uh, it looks like water. I, I showed this, um, one of the heads of the National Park Service was at Goddard last week and I got to show them this and they just thought, wow, waterfalls on the moon. Um, and this on a hyperwall, if you have the chance to come see a NASA hyperwall, get this image up there. It's just, <gasps> I could spend hours there. It's amazing. Um, and then this is another one where you can just see the activity. Isn't it amazing just to see how active just this impact crater looks like? It just shows you the power of what was unleashed when that rock from space hit the moon. Oh, I love it. Um, and so 
this is also not only showing us how impact cratering uh, is changing, but it's actually our presence at the moon for so long is showing us that the, the surface of the moon is churning up more than we expected. It's at a faster rate than we knew before the lunar reconnaissance orbiter was up there. Um, so that's really kind of a neat science result. Uh, if you want to build a lunar base on the moon, you have to account for a higher population of these small little um, objects hitting the moon than we had previously known. Um, and it's actually gonna turn up the the Apollo tracks, for example, faster than we ex anticipated. So they're still going to be there for a long time, but an order of magnitude less. So on the order of hundreds of thousands of years um, to millions of years, rather than many, many of those. Uh, but this was a fairly recent science result that I thought was very interesting. Um, it tells us about the dating of the surfaces. This one, um, some of you may know, and some of you may not. So take a moment and see if you can guess what that is. It's some evidence of recent volcanism on the moon. So this is not today, um, but this is on the order of tens of thousands of years old, maybe a million years old, maybe younger than that. Um, where it's still kind of small, and we have some, you know, we haven't gotten a sample, but. I think, it, so in case you're having trouble figuring out where's high and low, um, that main area is a low point and there's some kind of blobby thing. So um, Brent Gary, a geologist at um, NASA Goddard, explained it to me like, this is a big pool and then you drain the pool and all the pool toys are still left behind. So you're looking at a low area with pool toys or blobs of lava that are still on there. Um, so this happened, you know, not that long ago. In, in terms of geology, and when we're thinking of billions of years, this happened yesterday, which is amazing. And we've also found new kinds of volcanism on the moon with LRO, um, more silicic volcanism. This is another feature that we knew was around during the days of Apollo, but we did not realize that they're everywhere. So this is actually a scarp that is showing that the moon even maybe today is still shrinking it's still active there's still stuff going on and this is like you can picture a giant souffle that you just pulled out of the oven and it was all big and now as it's cooling as the moon is it's contracting and our giant souffle of a neighbor in space is contracting um, and getting those cracks all over its surface so they're all over this is a global process happening um, but i think that's so neat that there's don't worry it's going to be up there um, this is not going to be a giant uh, difference for anyone visible to see but i think it's it's still pretty neat um, also of course we're imaging the apollo landing sites every time we go by and we can see things like the astronaut footprints and all the equipment that was left behind so in honor of the apollo 50th anniversary um, you can go check these out um, look at them along the way um, and see what's going on this is apollo 17 and if you're not familiar with it a friend of ours, not on our team officially, or at least not yet, um, but Ben Feist has created Apollo17.org, and it allows you to relive the moments of this mission from start to finish um, while the, the team was on the surface. And it's remarkable, amazing, incredible, and I, I definitely encourage you to check that out. He's doing another one for Apollo 11, so stay tuned for that. But some really, really nice uh, material for you to take a look at and you can if you go to our website the LRO camera website you can actually watch you know the shadow of the flag um, throughout a lunar day and other things too because we have them from different times of day and you can see how sometimes you can really see what sticks out from the surface from the shadows and sometimes you can see what's light and dark um, and actually because of that different time of day we're learning new things about the Apollo landing sites that we didn't know um, so Jack Schmidt geologist walked on the moon you might have heard of him um, so he comes to Goddard sometimes and we'll look at imagery from the LRO camera combining it with what he remembers from being on the lunar surface, combining that with um, sample data, and we're, we're making new discoveries about, for example, Apollo 17 um, because of the context that our, our uh, spacecraft is able to provide. So today, almost 50 years later, um, we are learning still so much about uh, the moon because of Apollo and the legacy and, and what it built up. Um, last two things I just had to mention. We know the shape of the moon better than the shape of any other object in the solar system, including the Earth, or at least the solid surface of the Earth. Um, we actually know it better than any other object in the universe um, in terms of a planetary object. Um, and that's because 
course, the moon doesn't have the oceans that the earth has. So we, we know the shape of the moon better than the shape of the seafloor, which is kind of amazing. So much more to learn still here on earth. Um, but what we are learning about earth and the moon, of course, they, we learn about each other by learning together. Because the moon, I like to think of the moon, it has the baby pictures of the earth moon system. So we lost a lot of information on our planet because of our amazing recycling program here uh, through plate tectonics. Um, but the moon doesn't have that kind of uh, activity. So we do have some uh, very old surfaces that we can look at on the moon and learn about uh, the earth. So, and last bit, we found the coldest measured place in the solar system on the moon, colder than Pluto. Pluto, of course, has an atmosphere um, and it distributes heat better around its tiny little object way far out from the sun uh, than the moon, which is only tilted a tiny bit on its axis. And so, and without a substantial atmosphere, it does have an atmosphere, a surface boundary exosphere, if you want to impress people at your next cocktail party. Um, but it, it does have an atmosphere, but it's not really able to distribute heat very well. So the places that don't get light, these places on those permanently shadowed areas uh, are colder than Pluto or anywhere else beyond the vacuum of, or essential vacuum of space um, in our solar system. So I think that's kind of cool. And this, of course, is important for future exploration of the moon. So as we're looking to what's next, um, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and the other spacecraft around the moon and all of the other programs that have helped build up our knowledge of our, our neighbor are going to inform where we go next and how we survive there. And knowing where the energy is, where the sunlight is, where the resources are, is gonna be really important for that next step um, on the moon or those next steps and then beyond. So with that, I will thank you again so much for your time and for your attention. Um, I'm really, really happy to have been here with you this evening, and I would be delighted to answer any questions that you have about the moon, about LRO, about lunar science, planetary science um, related to it, um, or International Observers Moon Night, and just hear what you're doing or take your questions. So thank you very much. Uh, Andrea, that was fabulous. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. What was the name of the um, lunar atmosphere that I need to impress somebody at a cocktail? Uh, yes. Oh, I'm so glad you asked me. It's a surface boundary exosphere. So the line between our atmosphere around Earth and space um, is an exosphere. So we have an exosphere at the outer edge of our atmosphere as well, but it just has an atmosphere underneath it or a thicker layer of, of air. But the moon's atmosphere, um, the exosphere part is actually touching the surface of the, the moon. So it's called surface boundary exosphere. Cool, but, very yeah. cool. If anyone else has questions, we have a few um, coming up here. Make sure to put them in the Q&A section. Uh, if you put them in the chat, it might get lost. So uh, we had a question earlier about um, the 60th anniversary of NASA and are we, it's October 1st, right? Are we celebrating yes. that as well? Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. Whoever mentioned that I had a, um, I think that graphic came out when I was putting all of these together. I had way too many slides. I had to hold myself back. Um, <laughs> so thank you. Yes. October 1st is the, um, the 60th anniversary of NASA, we had, um, we've been celebrating that for a little while um, with, you know, there were a few steps along the way, but there's going to be a big broadcast um, and we are very happy to be, um, you know, of course, Apollo wouldn't have happened without the start of NASA. <laughs> so yeah, there's um, a whole site, I think it's nasa.gov slash 60 or something like that, um, but there will be lots of things going on. Um, for that event. Um, and then NASA is actually planning for the 50th and the 60th at the same time. So there's lots of different events going on um, for that as well. So yes, very exciting time. Awesome. Um, Darian O'Brien asked us about observing the moon and he gets asked as many of us do about uh, seeing the American flag placed by the Apollo 11 astronauts. Have there ever been any photos taken by subsequent spacecraft? We saw some of the tracks. I can't remember which Apollo mission that was from that you showed tonight. Um, but is there anything from the Apollo 11 astronauts? Have we taken images of that? I don't think oh, we Oh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. So yes, we have every Apollo landing site we have 
lots of imagery from every landing site. And yes, we definitely have Apollo 11 as well. Um, Apollo 11's flag is now lying on the surface of the moon because they put it too close to um, the ascent vehicle. Um, so it got knocked over, uh, but it's still there. Um, all the flags are still there that were brought to the moon. Um, they're probably now whitewashed by space weathering, um, but the material is still there. And you can still, like, for all of the, the standing flags, Flags, watch their shadows as they you know cross the lunar surface um, throughout the lunar day so yes they are there well we can't see it from our scopes in our backyards you can see it from NASA orbiters that's so exciting yeah. <laughs> and I didn't know it had fallen down Very yeah yeah you know you learn some things from going to the moon it's amazing put the flag farther <laughs> it's one of those things so the, they learned and they did it differently for the next mission and the other ones yeah so cool um, let's see, Willie Yee has asked, how many lunar missions are now active, including those from other countries? Oh, I should really know that off the top of my head. Um, it's really embarrassing that I don't. So <laughs> I might have to ask the internet for some help on this one. But NASA has um, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, of course. We also have two Artemis spacecraft um, that were originally solar missions, but are now helping us learn a lot more, especially about the plasma environment around the moon um, and that, that surface boundary exosphere out there, um, and just how the sun interacts with the moon and with, you know, lots of objects in space. We can learn a lot by studying that environment around the moon. Um, and then we have, you know, Chinese missions heading to the moon there, Indian um, spacecraft as well. Um, now there's, you know, a push towards private um, missions going to the moon. So it's gonna, you know, we're gonna have a lot of friends up there, you know, before too long. So it's great stuff to, to have such interest in the moon. But I don't remember the exact number. If anyone else, you know, knows it, Feel free to, to let us all know and teach you. Yeah, type it in. That's true. <laughs> yeah, takes a village here. Uh, and I love that it's become such an international destination. That's great. Oh, Dave. Dave comes up with it every time. A list of the oh. lunar missions. Um, thanks, Dave. Um, let's see. There were a couple of questions about the resources, the Earthrise video and those images, those crater images were amazing. Where do you find all of those? So they're all, I mean, the, so I'll start um, with the video. So I probably should have put um, this in there. And Vivian, you might have links to this on your fabulous page that you created. Mm -hmm. um, but all of the visualizations that NASA creates are put into NASA's scientific visualization studio. So Dave, if you want to type this out for us, um, it's svs.gsfc.nasa.gov. Um, and that's for all of NASA. It's based at Goddard, but we're for all of NASA. And we have some of the most talented people I know um, are the people who take NASA's data and then make it beautiful and interesting and understandable. Um, so we have been very, very lucky to have for the Lunar Reconnaissance Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, a team of people who have helped take our data and make it into um, visualizations like Earthrise. So that is created based on NASA Apollo archive data, as well as, you know, our data about like what the moon actually looks like right there along the path of the mission. It's not um, just something like, oh, maybe it looked like this. No, like that's actually what's there <laughs> right underneath at the time of day that they were there. And he even used the weather map from, you know, the day that the mission was at the moon based on satellite data of the earth and took it and made the cloud patterns match, like everything, <laughs> everything's right. Um, and that's all in the Scientific Visualization Studio archive. Anything that you want to look up, you just type in moon or you type in, you know, rose nebula or whatever it is that you want to see. Um, look for it in there. We have a lot of different content for all sciences at NASA. Um, for the images, those are all on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera website. And I believe that's lrock.se.se. E .asu.edu, but if you just look up LRO camera, um, it's their website and they have featured images um, and they recently got some new writers. So they're really trying to make the content of what they're finding with their cameras accessible and interesting and um, something that people can understand why they're so cool in addition to being amazing. Um, several of the images I featured in this talk, I think came from the Smithsonian Air and Space Collaboration 
Um, so I didn't actually select the images for that, um, but I am curating an exhibit for the Museum of Flight um, based on some of those images. So it's just fun to be like, these are my favorites. And, <laughs> and you can do the same thing. And I encourage you to do so. Very, very high resolution images are available on, on the LRO camera website. That is so fabulous. I love these images. Um, uh, Andrea was mentioning the website that uh, we have a lot of activities and other resources on, including 3D printed models of some of these craters. Um, that is bit.ly forward slash NSN moon night. <laughs> um, so we can put that in there again. And we'll try and get some of these images up there too, because that's got quite a few. Um, we've got quite a few images uh, that are amazing on there. So, um, and then she's got on the uh, main webpage, the moon.nasa.gov slash observe. That's where you can find everything. Um, so let's see, there are a couple of more questions before we finish. Uh, Ron asked that you mentioned a spot on the moon colder than Pluto. How cold is it? Ah. <laughs> That's a good question. Hold on. I'm, I have it in my notes. <laughs> I always, I'm not so good at numbers. Let's see. What is it? It's negative 248 degrees Celsius, negative 415 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and I had it, I think it's like 20 or 25 Kelvin. Um, whereas Pluto is only minus 184 C or minus 300 F. So. <laughs> you were I knew that would be a question and I wanted to come prepared. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I love those pictures of those craters. Um, and let's see, where do you get the Apollo 17 view of the entire mission? Oh, that's the um, Earthrise video. Is that? Uh, what no, we're... that's um, Apollo17.org. Oh, um, there you go. So that's a different place. So that's that was built by someone not associated with NASA. This is actually um, Ben Feist is just a, a lunar enthusiast and in his spare time, he recreated the entire mission um, and um, tracked all of the audio with all of the images taken with the tracks um, that were, uh, so everything is coordinated. It's really remarkable. Wow. Um, I, I definitely encourage you to check that out. <laughs> that is so cool. Um, let's see, I wanted to, end with one more thing. Let's see if I can share this from here. And then we will, well, let's see if I can share my screen really quickly, maybe. Let's see. Oh, yep. This is one of my favorites. And I just wanted to share it with you. I think you will all relate to this and you can find this on there as well. One second, it's a quick video and then we will finish up. Let's see. Hopefully you can see this now. Is it started? Oh. One night I was bored in my apartment and decided to take my telescope out to the side. Walk. The moon was out and I thought, why not? Within a few minutes, people started walking over and asking what this thing was. What is that, bro? It's a telescope. Do you want to check out the moon? Do you want to take a look at the moon? It's the moon. Where am I fucking here? You're supposed to look right here. Oh, in the Yeah. <laughs> That's where it all started. It just sort of went from there. Look at the moon. Hold on up there. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. I can't believe it. Oh, oh my god. Oh my god. No way. No way. No way. That's a moon. No way. No way. <laughs> Yeah, that is so cool. Oh, what? What? Look at the edge. I want to see more of it. 
never seen this before. I've never seen this before. Like this. Wow. That is intense right there, boy. Woo! Bro, that look like that's right down the street, man. Man, what you got here? Man, that look like that's right down the street. Yeah. It's like an actual image of the like a live This guy right there. To be able to see it up close and feel like you could almost reach out and touch it, and that's what makes it real to us. That is even incredible. I can't feel like I just went to <laughs> It makes you realize that we are all on a small little planet and we all have the same reaction to the universe we live in. Wow. Whoa. Wow. I think there's something special about that. Something unifying. It's a great reminder that we should look up more often. Well, thank you, Vivian. I love that one. That's so beautiful. As if you guys needed any more inspiration to go out and share the moon for this um, International Observe the Moon Night. I just want to thank you so much, Andrea, for coming and joining us tonight. I really appreciate it. We had such a good time. We got quite a few comments saying this is my favorite webinar yet. So thank you ah, so yay! much. <laughs> Well, it's been so fun um, being here with you. And I, I wanted to just close with one last mention um, because this is brand new also. Um, I just, I've been pursuing this with Vivian for, for some time. Um, and I just met with one of the head of strategic partnerships at NASA headquarters yesterday. And I think we are going to try to establish a partnership um, with StoryCorps for um, the Apollo anniversary. And Vivian's been pushing this, so I have to give her a lot of credit, and I have been so excited for this too. But um, it's again, bringing the people into the picture. So Apollo, um, the moon landing, I mean, I wish I was around. I'm very disappointed I was not around for it, but I hear it was pretty amazing at the time. Um, and I want to celebrate that. NASA wants to celebrate the human involvement and how everybody was a part of Apollo. If you were gripping onto your seat and just holding your breath while Neil Armstrong walked out into the moon or when they landed or any of those moments, you were united with humanity. Um, and we want to capture that and we want to save that. We want it archived in the Library of Congress for everyone for all time to have that, that memory of, of us um, available and accessible to everyone. Um, so we are hoping to have installations around the country. We're hoping to have an app where you can interview your grandparents, your grandkids, your neighbors, your friends, anybody to share the intergenerate intergeneration I can't say that between generations have that sharing um, and talk to talk to each other learn what's going on everyone has a favorite memory of the moon and everyone that remembers anything about Apollo um, we want to celebrate that so hopefully that's new and that's another way um, uh, that's coming out. and and 12 was another great um, mission and we're gonna celebrate science going to the moon um, with uh, the um, wives of the astronauts who are around from that mission um, coming up to Nancy, uh, Nancy Scott and others are really interested. So anyway, really exciting things. So thank you all so much for being here. I encourage you to go out, look at the moon, learn about the moon. We have um, lunar observers are, are most welcome, even if you're not having an event. Um, and, and again, thank you very much. Thanks, Vivian. And thanks all for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Andrea. That's great news. I'm really excited to hear. And I know you guys are all going to do amazing International Observe the Moon Night websites, um, events. And if you're watching this after the fact, um, find a club nearby or a solar system ambassador nearby and see what they have planned for tonight. Um, that is all for this evening. I want to thank you so much. You can find this webinar along with many others on the Night Sky Network website on the Outreach Resource section. You can just look it up by webinar. 
Each webinars page also features additional resources and activities. We'll post tonight's presentation on the YouTube channel also in a few days. I just wanted um, to get all that done. Thank you so much.